This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Eastman. September 2006. Dream Days by Kenneth Graham. Number 4. The Magic Ring. Grown-up people really ought to be more careful. Among themselves it may seem but a small thing to give their word and take back their word. For them there are so many compensations. Life lies at their feet, a party-colored India rubber ball. They may kick it this way or kick it that. It turns up blue, yellow, or green but always colored and glistening. Thus one sees it happen almost every day. And, with a jest and a laugh, the thing is over, and the disappointed one turns to fresh pleasure lying ready to his hand. But with those who are below them, whose little globe is swayed by them, who rush to build star-pointing alhambras on their most casual word, they really ought to be more careful. In this case of the circus, for instance, it was not as if we had led up to the subject. It was they who began it entirely, prompted thereto by the local newspaper. What a circus, said they, in their irritating, casual way. That would be nice to take the children to. Wednesday would be a good day. Suppose we go on Wednesday. Oh, and pleats are being worn again, with rows of deep braid, etc. What the others thought, I know not. What they said, if they said anything, I did not comprehend. For me, the house was bursting, walls seemed to cramp and to stifle, the roof was jumping and lifting. Escape was the imperative thing, to escape into the open air, to shake off bricks and mortar, and to wander in the unfrequented places of the earth, the more properly to take in the passion and the promise of the giddy situation. Nature seemed prim and staid that day, and the globe gave no hint that it was flying round a circus ring of its own. Could they really be true? I wondered, all those bewildering things I had heard tell of circuses? Did long-tailed ponies really walk on their hind legs and fire off pistols? Was it humanly possible for clowns to perform one half of the bewitching drolleries recorded in history? And how, oh, how dare I venture to believe that from off the backs of creamy Arab steeds, ladies of more than earthly beauty discharged themselves through paper hoops. No, it was not altogether possible. There must have been some exaggeration. Still, I would be content with very little. I would take a low percentage, a very small proportion of the circus myth would more than satisfy me. But, again, even supposing that history were, once in a way, no liar, could it be that I, myself, was really fated to look upon this thing in the flesh and to live through it, to survive the rapture? No, it was altogether too much. Something was bound to happen. One of us would develop measles, the world would blow up with a loud explosion, I must not dare, I must not presume to entertain the smallest hope. I must endeavor sternly to think of something else. Needless to say, I thought I dreamed of nothing else, day or night. Waking, I walked arm in arm with a clown, and cracked a portentous whip to the brave music of a band. Sleeping, I pursued, perched aside of a coal-black horse, a princess all gauze and spangles, 
who always managed to keep just one unattainable length ahead. In the early morning, Harold and I, once fully awake, cross-examined each other as to the possibilities of this or that circus tradition, and exhausted the lore long ere the first housemaid was stirring. In this state of exultation, we slipped onward to what promised to be a day of all white days. Which brings me right back to my text, that grown-up people really ought to be more careful. I had known it could never really be. I had said so to myself a dozen times. The vision was too sweetly ethereal for embodiment. Yet the pang of the disillusionment was none the less keen and sickening, and the pain was as that of a corporeal wound. It seemed strange and foreboding when we entered the breakfast room not to find everybody cracking whips, jumping over chairs and whooping in ecstatic rehearsal of the wild reality to come. The situation became grim and pallid indeed when I caught the expressions garden party and my mauve tool and realized that they both referred to that very afternoon and every minute as i sat silent and listened my heart sank lower and lower descending relentlessly like a clock weight into my boot soles throughout my agony i never dreamed of resorting to a direct question much less a reproach even during the period of joyful anticipation some fear of breaking the spell had kept me from any bald circus talk in the presence of them. But Harold, who was built in quite another way, so soon as he discerned the drift of their conversation, and heard the knell of all his hopes, filled the room with wail and clamor of bereavement. The grinning welkin rang with, Circus! Circus! shook the window-panes, the mocking walls re-echoed, Circus! Circus he would have, and the whole circus, and nothing but the circus. No compromises for him, no evasions, no fallacious, unsecured promises to pay. He had drawn his check on the bank of expectation, and it had got to be cashed then and there, else he would yell and yell himself into a fit and come out of it, and yell again. Yelling should be his profession, his art, his mission, his career. He was qualified, he was resolute, and he was in no hurry to retire from the business. The noisy ones of the world, if they do not always shout themselves into the imperial purple, are sure at least of receiving attention. If they cannot sell everything at their own price, one thing, silence, must at any cost be purchased of them. Harold, accordingly, had to be consoled by the employment of every specious fallacy and base-born trick known to those whose doom it is to handle children. For me, their hollow cajolery had no interest. I could pluck no consolation out of their bankrupt, though prodigal, pledges. I only waited till that hateful, well-known, Some other time, dear, told me that hope was finally dead. Then I left the room, without any remark. It made it worse, if anything could, to hear that stale, worn-out old phrase, still supposed by those dullards, to have some efficacy. To nature, as usual, I drifted by instinct, and there, out of the track of humanity, under a friendly hedgerow, had my black hour unseen. The world was a globe no longer, space was no more filled with whirling circuses of spheres. That day the old beliefs rose up and asserted themselves, and the earth was flat again, 
ditch-riddled, stagnant, and deadly flat. The undeviating roads crawled straight and white. Elms dressed themselves stiffly along inflexible hedges. All nature, centrifugal no longer, sprawled flatly in lines out to its farthest edge, and I felt just like walking out to that terminus and dropping quietly off. Then, as I sat there, morosely chewing bits of stick, the recollection came back to me of certain fascinating advertisements I had spelled out in the papers, advertisements of great and happy men owning big ships of tonnage running into four figures, who yet craved, to the extent of public supplication, for the sympathetic cooperation of youths as apprentices. I did not rightly know what apprentices might be, nor whether I was yet big enough to be styled a youth, but one thing seemed clear, that, by some such means as this, whatever the intervening hardships, I could eventually visit all the circuses of the world, the circuses of merry France and gaudy Spain, of Holland and Bohemia, of China and Peru. Here was a plan worth thinking out in all its bearings, for something had presently to be done to end this intolerable state of things. Midday, and even feeding time, passed by gloomily enough, till a small disturbance occurred which had the effect of releasing some of the electricity with which the air was charged. Harold, it should be explained, was of a very different mental mould, and never brooded, moped, nor ate his heart out over any disappointment. One wild outburst, one dissolution of a minute into his original elements of air and water, of tears and outcry, so much insulted nature claimed. Then he would pull himself together, iron out his countenance with a smile, and adjust himself to the new condition of things. If the gods are ever grateful to man for anything, it is when he is so good as to display a short memory. The Olympians were never slow to recognize this quality of Harold's, in which indeed their salvation lay, and on this occasion their gratitude had taken the practical form of a fine fat orange, tough-rinded, as oranges of those days were wont to be. This he had eviscerated in the good old-fashioned manner, by biting out a hole in the shoulder, inserting a lump of sugar therein, and then working it cannily, till the whole soul and body of the orange passed glorified through the sugar into his being. Thereupon, filled full of orange juice and iniquity, he conceived a deadly snare. Having deftly patted and squeezed the orange skin till it resumed its original shape, he filled it up with water, inserted a fresh lump of sugar in the orifice, and, issuing forth, blandly proffered it to me as I sat moodily in the doorway, dreaming of strange wild circuses under tropic skies. Such a stale old dodge as this would hardly have taken me in at ordinary moments, but Harold had reckoned rightly upon the disturbing effect of ill-humour, and had guessed, perhaps, that I thirsted for comfort and consolation, and would not criticize too closely the source from which they came. Unthinkingly, I grasped the golden fraud, which collapsed at my touch, and squirted its contents into my eyes and over my collar, till the nethermost parts of me were damp with the water that had run down my neck. In an instant I had Harold down, and, with all the energy of which I was capable, devoted myself to grinding his head into the gravel. While he, realizing that the closure was applied, and that the time for discussion or argument was past, sternly concentrated his powers on kicking me in the stomach. 
Some people can never allow events to work themselves out quietly. At this juncture, one of them swooped down on the scene, pouring shrill, misplaced abuse on both of us. On me, for ill-treating my younger brother, whereas it was distinctly I who was the injured and the deceived, on him for the high offence of assault and battery on a clean collar, a collar which I had myself deflowered and defaced shortly before, in sheer desperate ill-temper. Disgusted and defiant, we fled in different directions, rejoining each other later in the kitchen garden and as we strolled along together, our short feud forgotten, Harold observed gloomily, "'I should like to be a caveman, like Uncle George was tellin' us about, with a flint hatchet and no clothes, and live in a cave and not know anybody.' "'And if any one came to see us we didn't like,' I joined in, catching on to the points of the idea, We'd hit him on the head with the hatchet till he dropped down dead. And then, said Harold, warming up, we'd drag him into the cave and skin him. For a space, we gloated silently over the fair scene our imaginations had conjured up. It was blood we felt the need of just then. We wanted no luxuries, nothing dear-bought nor far-fetched. Just plain blood, and nothing else and plenty of it. Blood, however, was not to be had. The time was out of joint, and we had been born too late. So we went off to the greenhouse, crawled into the heating arrangement underneath, and played at the dark and dirty and unrestricted life of cavemen, till we were heartily sick of it. Then we emerged once more into historic times, and went off to the road to look for something living and sentient to throw stones at. Nature, so often a cheerful ally, sometimes sulks and refuses to play, when in this mood she passes the word to her underlings, and all the little people of fur and feather take the hint and slip home quietly by back streets. In vain we scouted, lurked, crept, and ambuscaded. Everything that usually scurried, hopped, or fluttered, the small society of the undergrowth, seemed to have engagements elsewhere. The horrid thought that perhaps they had all gone off to the circus occurred to us simultaneously, and we humped ourselves up on the fence and felt bad. Even the sound of approaching wheels failed to stir any interest in us. When you are bent on throwing stones at something, humanity seems obtrusive and better away. Then suddenly... We both jumped off the fence together, our faces clearing. For our educated ear had told us that the approaching rattle could only proceed from a dog-cart, and we felt sure it must be the funny man. We called him the funny man because he was sad and serious and said little, but gazed right into our souls and made us tell him just what was on our minds at the time and then came out with some magnificently luminous suggestion that cleared every cloud away. What was more, he would then go off with us at once and play the thing right out to its finish, earnestly and devotedly, putting all other things aside. So we called him the funny man, meaning only that he was different from those others who thought it incumbent on them to play the painful mummer. The ideal, as opposed to the real man, was what we meant, only we were not acquainted with the phrase. Those others, with their labored jests and clumsy contortions, doubtless flattered themselves that they were funny men, we who had to sit through and applaud the painful performance knew better. He pulled up to a walk as soon as he caught sight of us, and the dog-cart crawled slowly along till it stopped just opposite. 
Then he leant his chin on his hand, and regarded us long and soulfully, yet said he never a word, while we jigged up and down in the dust, grinning bashfully, but with expectation, for you never knew exactly what this man might say or do. "'You look bored,' he remarked presently. "'Thoroughly bored. "'Or else, let me see, you're not married, are you?' "'He asked this in such sad earnestness "'that we hastened to assure him we were not married. "'Though we felt he ought to have known that much, "'we had been intimate for some time. "'Then it's only boredom,' he said. "'Just satiety and world-weariness. "'Well, if you assure me you aren't married, "'you can climb into this cart, and I'll take you for a drive. "'I'm bored, too. "'I want to do something dark and dreadful and exciting.' "'We clambered in, of course, yapping with delight "'and treading all over his toes. "'And as we set off, Harold demanded of him imperiously whither he was going. "'My wife,' he replied, "'has ordered me to go and look up the curate and bring him home to tea. "'Does that sound sufficiently exciting for you?' "'Our faces fell. "'The curate of the hour was not a success from our point of view. "'He was not a funny man in any sense of the word.' "'But I'm not going to,' he added cheerfully. "'Then I was to stop at some cottage and ask, "'What was it? "'There was nettle rash mixed up in it, I'm sure. "'But never mind, I've forgotten, and it doesn't matter. "'Look here, we're three desperate young fellows who stick at nothing. "'Suppose we go off to the circus.' Of certain supreme moments it is not easy to write. The varying shades and currents of emotion may indeed be put into words by those specially skilled that way. They often are, at considerable length. But the sheer crude article itself, the strong, live thing that leaps up inside you and swells and strangles you, the dizziness of revulsion that takes the breath like cold water. Who shall depict this and live? All I knew was that I would have died then and there, cheerfully, for the funny man, that I longed for red Indians to spring out from the hedge on the dog-cart just to show what I would do, and that, with all this, I could not find the least little word to say to him. Harold was less taciturn. With shrill voice, uplifted in solemn chant, he sang the great spheral circus song and the undying glory of the ring. Of its timeless beginning he sang, of its fashioning by cosmic forces, and of its harmony with the stellar plan. Of horses he sang, of their strength, their swiftness, and their docility as to tricks. Of clowns, again, of the glory of knavery, and of the eternal type that shall endure. Lastly, he sang of her, the woman of the ring, flawless, complete, untrammeled in each subtly curving limb, earth's highest output, time's noblest expression. At least... He doubtless sang all these things and more. He certainly seemed to, though all that was distinguishable was, We're going to the circus! And then, once more, We're going to the circus! The sweet, rhythmic phrase repeated again and again. But, indeed, I cannot be quite sure, for I heard confusedly, as in a dream, Wings of fire sprang from the old mare's shoulders. We whirled on our way through purple clouds, and earth and the rattle of wheels were far away below. The dream and the dizziness 
were still in my head when I found myself, scarce conscious of intermediate steps, seated actually in the circus at last, and took in the first sniff of that intoxicating circus smell that will stay by me while this clay endures. The place was beset by a hum and a glitter and a mist, suspense brooded large o'er the blank mysterious arena. Strung up to the highest pitch of expectation, we knew not from what quarter, in what divine shape, the first surprise would come. A thud of unseen hoofs first set us a quiver, then a crash of cymbals, a jangle of bells, a hoarse applauding roar, and Coralie was in the midst of us, whirling past twixt earth and sky, now erect, flushed, radiant, now crouched to the flowing mane, swung and tossed and moulded by the maddening dance-music of the band. The mighty whip of the Count in the frock-coat marked time with pistol-shots, his war-cry, whooping clear above the music, fired the blood with a passion for splendid deeds, as Coralie, laughing, exultant, crashed through the paper hoops. We gripped the red cloth in front of us, and our souls sped round and round with Coralie, leaping with her, prone with her, swung by mane or tail with her. It was not only the ravishment of her delirious feats, nor her cream-coloured horse of fairy breed, long-tailed, row-footed, an enchanted prince, surely, if ever there was one. It was her more than mortal beauty, displayed, too, under conditions never vouchsafed to us before, that held us spellbound. What princess had arms so dazzlingly white, or went delicately clothed in such pink and spangles? Hitherto we had known the outward woman as but a drab thing, hourglass-shaped, nearly legless, bunched here, constricted there, slow of movement, and given to deprecating lusty action of limb. Here was a revelation. From henceforth our imaginations would have to be revised and corrected up to date. In one of those swift rushes the mind makes in high-strung moments, I saw myself and Coralie, close enfolded, pacing the world together, o'er hill and plain, through storied cities, past rows of applauding relations, I in my Sunday knickerbockers, she in her pink and spangles. Summers sicken, flowers fail and die, all beauty but rides round the ring and out at the portal. Even so Coralie passed in her turn, poised sideways, panting on her steed, lightly swayed as a tulip bloom, bowing on this side and on that as she disappeared. And with her went my heart and my soul, and all the light and the glory and the entrancement of the scene. Harold woke up with a gasp. "'Wasn't she beautiful?' he said, in quite a subdued way for him. I felt a momentary pang. We had been friendly rivals before, in many an exploit, but here was altogether a more serious affair. Was this, then, to be the beginning of strife and coldness, of civil war on the hearthstone, and the sundering of old ties? Then I recollected the true position of things, and felt very sorry for Harold, for it was inexorably written that he would have to give way to me, since I was the elder. Rules were not made for nothing in a sensibly constructed universe. There was little more to wait for now Coralie had gone, yet I lingered still on the chance of her appearing again. Next moment the clown tripped up and fell flat with magnificent artifice, and at once fresh emotions began to stir. Love had endured its little hour, and stern ambition now asserted itself. 
Oh, to be a splendid fellow like this, self-contained, ready of speech, agile beyond conception, braving the forces of society, his hand against everyone, yet always getting the best of it. What freshness of humour! What courtesy to dames! What triumphant ability to discomfit rivals, frock-coated and moustached though they might be! and what a grand, self-confident straddle of the legs! Who could desire a finer career than to go through life thus gorgeously equipped? Success was his keynote, adroitness his panoply, and the mellow music of laughter his instant reward. Even Coralie's image wavered and receded. I would come back to her in the evening, of course but I would be a clown all the working hours of the day. The short interval was ended. The band, with long-drawn chords, sounded a prelude touched with significance, and the program, in letters overtopping their fellows, proclaimed Zephyrine, the bride of the desert, in her unequalled bareback equestrian interlude. So sated was I already with beauty and with wit, that I hardly dared hope for a fresh emotion. Yet her title was tinged with romance, and Coralie's display had aroused in me an interest in her sex, which even herself had failed to satisfy entirely. Brayed in by trumpets, Zephyrine swung passionately into the arena. With a bound she stood erect, one foot upon each of her supple, plunging Arabs and at once I knew that my fate was sealed, my chapter closed, and the bride of the desert was the one bride for me. Black was her raiment, great silver stars shone through it, caught in the dusky twilight of her gauze. Black as her own hair were the two mighty steeds she bestrode, in a tempest they thundered by, in a whirlwind, a sirocco of tan. Her cheeks bore the kiss of an eastern sun, and the sandstorms of her native desert were her satellites. What was Coralie, with her pink silk, her golden hair and slender limbs, beside this magnificent, full-figured Cleopatra? In a twinkling we were scouring the desert, she and I and the two coal-black horses. Side by side, keeping pace in our swinging gallop, we distanced the ostrich, we outstrode the zebra, and, as we went, it seemed the wilderness blossomed like the rose. I know not rightly how we got home that evening. On the road there were everywhere strange presences, and the thud of phantom hoofs encircled us. In my nose was the pungent circus smell. The crack of the whip and the frank laugh of the clown were in my ears. The funny man thoughtfully abstained from conversation, and left our illusion quite alone, sparing us all jarring criticism and analysis. And he gave me no chance, when he deposited us at our gate, to get rid of the clumsy expressions of gratitude I had been laboriously framing. For the rest of the evening, distraught and silent, I only heard the march music of the band playing on in some corner of my brain. When at last my head touched the pillow, in a trice I was with Zephyrine riding the boundless Sahara, cheek to cheek, the world well lost while at times, through the sand-clouds that encircled us, glimmered the eyes of Coralie, touched, one fancied, with something of a tender reproach. End of The Magic Ring from Dream Days by Kenneth Graham